Good evening. My name is Pauline Hovey, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, I would like to welcome you to this evening's program, Women and Men in the Iraq War, What Can a Feminist Curiosity Reveal? The U.S. invaded Iraq on March 20th, 2003, as part of the broader global war on terror that followed the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Three weeks after the invasion of Iraq, nearly a quarter century of rule by Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein came to a dramatic end. On April 9th, 2003, U.S. Marines helped Iraqi civilians topple a massive statue of Saddam in Firdaus Square in the Iraqi capital. This act marked the end of Saddam Hussein's rule and regime. President Bush maintains that Iraqi civilians are better off without Saddam Hussein. However, the plight of Iraqi women has not improved. Saddam Hussein ran a secular government that gave women significant educational, professional, and social freedoms. Although many Iraqis detested Saddam Hussein's dictatorship at the time, they now fear that the future will only bring greater oppression and restrictions for Iraqi women. Since 2003, unemployment has increased among men, placing an extra burden on women's lives. Despite these grave situations, there is little public discussion of the effects of the U.S. invasion on Iraqi women. In this lecture, Cynthia Enloe will facilitate this discussion by posing feminist questions about the Iraq War. Cynthia Enloe is an internationally acclaimed scholar whose work focuses on women's politics nationally and internationally. She is the author of nine books, including the widely acclaimed Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics. In this book, Enloe poses a simple question. What happens to our understanding of international politics if we place women's lives at the center of our analysis? In attempting to answer this question, Enlo focuses on seven major areas of gendered international politics. Tourism, nationalism, the military, diplomacy, and the female international labor force in agriculture, textiles, and domestic service. Professor Enlo completed her undergraduate education at Connecticut College and earned an MA and PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. She is currently a research professor in the International Development, Community, and Environment Department and director of the Women's Studies Department at Clark University. Cynthia Enloe will speak as part of the Morgan Lecture for 2008. The Morgan Lectureship was endowed by the Board of Trustees in 1929 in grateful appreciation for the distinguished service of James Henry Morgan of the class of 1878. This lectureship brings to campus a scholar to meet informally with individuals and class groups and to deliver the Morgan Lectures on topics in the social sciences and humanities. At this time, I would like to invite you to join Continuing the Conversation at 4.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon in the underground area of the Holland Union Building, where further conversation on this topic will ensue. Also, I would like to remind you to please turn off all cell phones and pagers. Also, since this program is being taped and some of our audience members may be hearing impaired, please wait for a microphone to reach you before asking a question during the question and answer service at the end of the program. Thank you, and now please join me in welcoming Professor Enloe. to be here. Um, I'm delighted. It's my first. Um, is the mic working? Are you, are you doing okay back there? No. Kind of? Not really? We have our techie guy. Is techie guy <laughs> working things? Is that better now? Yeah. Better. Okay. I'm, in fact, I'm not me. I am simply the product of your tech guy. <laughs> right? So, um, um, but I'm delighted. I am absolutely delighted to be here at Dickinson's. My first visit to Dickinson, my first visit to Carlisle, and um, I've had such a good time today. I've had a chance to meet women's studies faculty. I've had a chance to talk with 
uh, Professor Stewart's um, students this afternoon, and then a wonderful uh, dinner conversation this evening. So it's been great, as well as um, one of your student radio um, interviewers, who is very good. Um, so it's, it's been a very full and rich um, uh, and enjoyable day. Um, when the um, when Heather and the other folks at the uh, Clark Forum uh, began talking with me some months ago about what might be interesting to have a discussion about, um, I thought that this might be the time. Um, that was the time. This is the time. Probably a year from now will be the time um, to really think about what um, asking feminist questions brings to our understanding of the Iraq war, which, as all of you know, has just entered its sixth year, which is now longer than the US involvement in World War II. Um, and the kinds of questions that feminists, and it's not just me, obviously, what feminists ask are, feminists are questions about where women are, um, and uh, as um, was described earlier, the, not the first time, but the time that I really began trying to make sense of this was in uh, when I was trying to think about the banana industry, um, as well as about tourism and domestic work. And what I realized was, I was at Berkeley when Berkeley was Berkeley um, in the 60s, you know, supposedly radical um, uh, campus uh, organizing. Um, and I was in political science, and I was a student then of Southeast Asian politics. What I now, what I realized when I became more feminist um, in my consciousness, which I have to say many of your students here are, are much way, way, way ahead of where I was, not only as an undergraduate, but as a graduate student. Um, so I, it's really embarrassing to think how long it took me. But when I began to be nudged by students and fan, friends who were more feminist than I was um, to ask more feminist questions. Here's one of the things I began to realize, that I had really underestimated power. I was supposedly um, a student of politics, a political scientist. Um, but in fact, before I began asking feminist questions, I really had um, I had an inflated notion of how realistic I was about the workings of power. Once you start taking women's lives seriously, once you start looking really at the history of domestic work as a topic of serious consideration in international politics, that is, who, who is cleaning the tubs in Hong Kong is not a small issue, and why they're doing it and who benefits. But once I began asking that sort of question, um, what I realized is that I had uh, underestimated how much effort governments put in to trying to control women, how much effort governments put in to trying to make sure that women do the things that governments need them to do. And if they're cleaning tubs in Hong Kong, it's in order to send remittances back home to the Philippines and also to elevate the middle class and the affluent upper class in Hong Kong so that they feel as though they are privileged. Um, and the governments work very hard, and they think a lot, but they don't tell us much about what they're thinking. That is, they don't want to be caught taking women seriously. Um, but in fact, they strategize a lot. And I want to start with thinking about where mothers have been in the US waging of the war in Iraq as an example of how much effort is put into thinking about mothers, women as mothers. Um, mothers, women as mothers, um, make governments really nervous. Um, they, don't, they don't trust women as mothers because they're really afraid that women really will care more about their kids than they will about the government's use of them. So the evidence of this in the United States is that um, not the Defense Department really is, gives a lot of thought about how to um, approach women so that they will encourage their sons and daughters uh, to join the US military. Um, there is a very well-known, well, maybe it's not well-known here, but it's a, a stunning ad. Uh, the US uh, Defense Department is one of the major um, uh, clients for uh, advertising agencies, and advertising agencies compete uh, really um, strenuously to try and get the Defense Department recruiting ad account. Um, the 
Marines have their own account and their own agency, the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy. They all have separate ad agencies, and ad agencies um, in um, Madison Avenue compete for them. And so this was an ad that was created um, about a year and a half ago when the Defense Department was becoming very nervous uh, about the decline in um, interest in uh, volunteering for the U.S. military. That is, we're already two years, two and a half years into the war in Iraq. Um, the bloom was off the rose, so to speak. Um, and the worry was that um, people that the Defense Department call influencers, now that's like somebody who has you know, an upset stomach, but it's not. An influencer is, um, is a, a, guidance, a high school guidance counselor. This is who the Defense Department has in their sights, if you will. They uh, guidance high school guidance counselors, and they work very hard. You, if you ever want to do research, you're looking for an honors thesis or a senior seminar paper, um, go and talk to lots of high school uh, guidance counselors about their relationship to the military. And you will find that many of them have very mixed, uh, but um, oftentimes quite intense relationships with the Defense Department. Um, so guidance counselors in high school, fathers, mothers, clergy people, and athletic coaches. They are the people, I mean, these, the U.S. Defense Department, this is not conspiratorial, they are very they are very sophisticated and very nuanced in their thinking about the U.S. military's relationship to the very dynamic and uh, complex American society. So when they do recruiting, they really target, if you pardon the pun, they really target those groups quite individually. And a lot of advertising um, that they farm out to Madison Avenue uh, ad agencies is really directed at one of those groups. Uh, when the um, enlistments were declining, uh, the interest of um, 16, 17, 18, and 19 year olds was declining um, starting at least two years ago. They created an ad with um, a ad agency and the ad and maybe some of you saw it. It was very interesting because it was placed, you know, if you're doing communications, it's not just the content of the ad, it's where is it placed. This was a television ad, and it was placed um, in the afternoon. And um, it was placed between, um, what's, what's her name, Judge Judy? What, wait, or, no, Judging Amy. I am not up on my reruns. Um, Judging Amy and Law and Order. It was, the ad was placed right in between them in the middle of the afternoon. And the assumption was that um, not retired vets sitting at my favorite low market tavern where I have lunch, that was not their main um, um, audience that they had in mind. It was supposedly women who work very odd jobs or part-time jobs or nighttime jobs and might have the television on at two o'clock in the afternoon. And here was the ad. The ad uh, was done in kind of sepia colors. It was a very, it, was, it wasn't red, white, and blue with, with you know, a Sousa marching band in the background at all. It was much more subtle than that. And it showed a um, African-American woman sitting in her kitchen, at her kitchen table, with lots of papers in front of her, obviously paying her bills. Um, and then the door opens and into the room comes a um, young, 18, 19 year old uh, African American young man, and clearly this is her, her son coming home from high school uh, in the afternoon. And she looks up and he says to her, Now, these are all actors, remember, so this is all scripted. He says to her, Mom, I think I found the solution. And she looks up it, with interest and she said, You know, Mom, how we've been talking about how I can get to med school. She says, oh, yeah, it's a lot of money. And he said, well, you know, I've been talking to the Army recruiter at, who came to the high school, and I think I've got a way to do it. I think if I join the Army that they will pay for my future education, and then our, meaning the son and mother, who are obviously economic collaborators here trying to figure out this terrible problem of how to pay for college, I think our problem will be solved. Now, this is a very sophisticated ad. 
and it's done, it, as with all advertisements, you always have to place them historically, right? The camera then switches over to the mom, and she sort of, she doesn't say, oh, great. She kind of raises her eyebrows with considerable skepticism. Um, because the Defense Department knows that that's the reality, that, in fact, African-American mothers have begun to really change their notions about what is uh, a good uh, future for their sons. And this is actually something we can talk about later. But um, she raises her eyebrows in visible uh, skepticism. And he says, no, 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 Mom. Look, it's about time I became a man. Now. This is the Defense Department, together with Madison Avenue, trying to imagine women as mothers' anxieties about their son's manliness. Not just about economics, definitely not about patriotism. There was no discussion about service to your country. This was about the cost of education and mothers doing bills and the clincher was, well, if you don't think it's a really good idea of, because of the timing of when I might be joining the military, at least I know you're concerned about my becoming a man. Now, that's just a teeny tiny little scrap of evidence about the amount of thinking that goes into the Defense Department's thinking about women as mothers. The, woman that I've been particularly interested in is a woman named Charlene Kane, C-A-I-N, was a real woman. She lives out in um, Berlin, Wisconsin, a small rural town in Wisconsin. And when I was doing a um, talk at University of Wisconsin, in fact, there were some students from Berlin um, um, in the conversation. And um, Berlin's not very uh, economically affluent. And Charlene Kane, who was profiled in The New Yorker, and this becomes very interesting because The New Yorker um, journalist, very good articles in The New Yorker, and The New Yorker journalist obviously was more interested in um, Mrs. Kane's son. But you could tell as he began to take on this journalistic um, assignment, he actually became more interested in Charlene Kane. So she's a middle-aged woman. And she has a son named Michael. And Michael um, was really becoming a couch potato. Um, he, had gradu he had just was coming to the end of his high school career several years ago. And um, the armor recruiters came to town. Now, this matters that this is a rural town in Wisconsin. There is a sociologist at the University of Texas who has been trying to figure out what, what demographic um, is most uh, prominent in the casualties that the U.S. forces, not now, not the Iraqis, but the U.S. forces have, what is the demographic that really stands out um, for those um, U.S. soldiers that have been killed in, um, in Iraq? And what he found in this war is that the most overrepresented group of soldiers that have, U.S. soldiers that have been killed in Iraq are from rural, small towns. More so than race, more so than ethnicity, um, it, and even, well, it's, there's a lot of parallels with class because there's so much rural poverty. And, and after I read that, I began listing for the military recruiters' um, uh, strategies, and in fact, they do really focus on rural high schools. Um, because they know that in rural America today, and some of you probably come from small towns, it is really an economic wasteland out there in rural small towns. Those are the young people who, as they approach their senior year, can't imagine what they're going to do. And they are also the people whose parents oftentimes do not have the resources to send them uh, to college, even state universities, which are becoming more and more expensive. Um, and ever since then, in the New York Times, and my guess is in the Washington Post as well, 
Um, every couple of days, the Times, no matter, in, in, embedded as a box in some story, lists all the most recently, unfortunately, only American um, uh, people who have died um, as military personnel in Iraq. And now I read all the towns. And one of the things I've noticed, I actually try to read all the names as well, just in my head. But I stand there in the kitchen in the morning, um, or my first cup of coffee, and I turn the page to see if I can find the box, and then I read the towns. And one of the things since this uh, sociologist began to point this out was I realized I've never heard of most of the towns that most of these young people, and they're not young and not so young. I mean, it's, it's 19, 24, 35, 42. We shouldn't just say young people, right? But most of them are coming from small towns that really I've never heard the names of before. Um, so Berlin, Wisconsin is really a place to take seriously as to how women are being, if you will, mobilized to support the war in uh, Iraq, the US war in Iraq. And Michael was one of these young people who was really, um, he had two enthusiasms. Otherwise, he really was really floundering. And his mother knew he was floundering. He has two real interests. One is the Green Bay Packers. And personally, I totally understand that, all right? I mean, because they play outdoors, right? They play in the snow. I mean, you know, anyway, so they're my heroes anyway. But so I can understand Michael being very excited about the Green Bay Packers. And he collected all the memorabilia, you know, the green and yellow pro football memorabilia of the Green Bay Packers. And the other was Harley Davidson uh, motorbikes, which of course he couldn't afford, but he collected all the posters and all the stuff. A lot of stuff goes along with uh, motorcycles. And, but other than that, he had no interest. Well, he, at, at the end of high school, he too came home and said, Mom, I found something to do that'll get me out of town. And, and she was not displeased. It wasn't something that she really thought about. But you know, a lot of women as mothers really worry about what their kids are going to do at age 18 when they're in a dead-end economic region. So she, wasn't, she didn't protest against it. She did, wasn't exactly what she had in mind. But at least Michael seemed kind of excited about doing something. So he got trained in boot camp as a uh, truck driver. He was deployed very soon after um, boot camp to Iraq. Um, and you can imagine where this might be going. He, um, in one of his convoys, a lot of people who are being killed and severely wounded in Iraq amongst um, Americans, of course, are not combat troops. This whole notion of combat, which was so um, ideologically loaded around, should women be in combat, as if we knew what combat was. Um, this has really almost disappeared from the American um, anxiety discourse um, during this war, because it's so meaningless. Um, and Michael didn't have a combat job. He was driving a truck in a convoy, and his truck hit a roadside bomb, and he was severely injured, and he was medevaced uh, first to Germany, that's what usually happens, and then back to Walter Reed Hospital in um, Washington. And um, he had to have his left leg amputated. Now he's about 19 years old. Um, and now he is an amputee, and he's at Walter Reed Hospital. And he was severely, not surprisingly, severely depressed. And the people at Walter Reed in the amputee wards are, in fact, amongst the most engaged. And we'll come to this, because it really matters. It matters what kind of wound you are inflicted with in Iraq as to what kind of attention you get. And that will, in fact, in, in, in turn, affect your mother's relationship to the military system, to the medical system, and to you as their son or daughter. The, ampu the um, soldiers that are severely wounded and have to have a limb amputated, from what we know now, um, are getting amongst the best treatment. But that treatment in Walter Reed, and this is very reasonable treatment now, this is, I mean, very understandable that this would be the way they think, they thought it was important to have parents come and take part in the therapy. Makes sense, right? Now watch. That is a, a military medical system that is going to depend on parents being involved. That's part of war waging. There are more... And that's not a bad, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's just something when you kind of think, 
what is this war, and who does it take to wage this war, and who does it take to keep this war from being seen as instantly illegitimate, then think about the worries that parents won't be or won't be able to be as involved as the military medical system needs them to be. Because in this war, and some of you have read about this, in this war, um, we have come a long way, I should put all that in quotes, but from the MASH unit. Some of you read, you, you watch reruns of MASH, right, which was set in the Korean War and was gallows humor and so on. But MASH is very interesting because MASH was itself a technological innovation. It was met using, taking medical services and pushing them as close to the front lines as possible, um, which was considered in the 1950s a great um, innovation. Um, now the innovation is rapid um, uh, medevacking to Germany and then back to the United States for intensive medical care. The result is that a much higher percentage of um, soldiers that are inflicted with traumatic injury are surviving. That is, if you take, there are people who do this, if you take um, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the first Gulf War, and this Iraq War, one of the things that is changing is a higher and higher percentage of soldiers, American soldiers, who are traumatically, severely injured are living with those injuries. But that means you have to have parents. That means you have to have wives. That means you have to have a support system that will be a support system for the next 40 years, next 45 years. It's not without cost, even though that looks like a great advance. If you don't have mothers and fathers and wives, and to some extent husbands, but particularly mothers, fathers, and wives, and oftentimes mothers and wives especially, the caretakers of the family. If they are not mobilized to, in fact, engage with, which means oftentimes reorganize their life for the sake of long-term, long-term intensive parental or family spousal care, you could not wage the war this, the way this war is waged. So Walter Reed Hospital calls Charlene Kane and asks her, as good medical people would, please come to Washington. She's in Berlin, Wisconsin. Please come to Washington and be engaged with us in Michael's um, therapy because he is so depressed. And if he's depressed, we can't get him involved in this very rigorous um, uh, um, uh, uh, therapy, physical therapy. So now, this is Charlene Kane's situation, right? Wars are not fought just by moving, you know, miniature battalions around on a chessboard. Charlene Kane has a very complicated life. She's not just easily mo mobilizable. To say somebody is mobilizable means that they are easily taken up from the very complex web of relationships they're in and detached from those relationships and used for something else. It's one of the reasons that militaries all over the world like young people. All right? It's much harder. That's why mobilizing the National Guard is much different than mobilizing uh, young people on active duty because people in the National Guard are embedded in social relationships. They are much harder to mobilize. And Charlene Kane, a civilian, in fact, was the following. She was married. She had an adult man at home, her husband. He had suffered a severe back injury um, at work. Um, and so while he tried to help out at home, he no longer could earn um, a living to help the family. She had a uh, mentally, um, emotionally disturbed uh, adult daughter who had was not able to care for the daughter she had had. So Charlene took both her emotionally disturbed daughter and essentially Charlene's granddaughter into the household. And she was supporting them all as a bookkeeper at a regional um, health clinic. Not so easy just to go and spend a month in Washington. So here is how the healthcare system worked for the waging of the war in Iraq. All her 
good pals at the health clinic, her co-workers, women, got together and they figured out a way that they could each take a day of her job and they'd rotate it for several weeks. They'd fill in for her so that she wouldn't lose a penny of her pay. All those women doing that for the sake of Charlene, not necessarily for the sake of the war, in fact, is what made it possible for Walter Reed to have a mother there that could help Michael recover from his uh, amputation. She did this. They got to the point that Michael was declared well enough um, to go back to Berlin to Charlene's household, and he is now part of that household, which is only possible because she is there willing, for how long? To be his primary caretaker. But here's the other thing, and you've probably read about this in the paper because there's been so much uh, discussion belatedly about the, not just the Veterans Administration, but the uh, active duty military's attitude towards severely injured uh, soldiers. And that is, there is lots of paperwork. If you don't speak English as a first language, and you are not very comfortable with literacy, and you are daunted by forms, which, to tell you the truth, I just did my taxes, I am. Um, but if you are not all three of those things, now think of how many people that excludes in American society today. It, you cannot get the health care that you need for your severely injured son. And the reporter, this very good reporter for The New Yorker, went back to Berlin, Wisconsin with Charlene. This is good reporting. He didn't just do the story at Walter Reed. He followed Charlene and her son Michael back to Berlin, and here's what he described. He described Charlene was now back at her job as a bookkeeper at the uh, regional health clinic, and every night she came home to her second job, which she stood in the kitchen and did two hours of Veterans Administration paperwork every night, because otherwise he would not be getting the ongoing therapy he needs or the drugs he needs or the special referrals for yet He's already had seven operations for yet the next set of operations that he'd need. And that, when I think of this war, I try to think of Charlene Kane standing in her modest kitchen in Berlin, Wisconsin, because that is part of how to make a tally of, quote, the costs of this war. The costs of the war now are the U.S., just the U.S., not the Ukrainian, not the Spanish, not the Honduran, not the British, Right? Not all the other governments that have been um, brought in to be the coalition of the willing, but just the American cost of the war is now $5,000 a minute. Right? Wait, do I have the right? Because that, that sounds too little. Wait, that sounds too little. No, it's $5,000 per minute. So I figure tonight we are, what, $12 million event here? Um, it's... Um, the, I said thousand, I meant, I meant a uh, million, um, right. The, because it's now $2 billion a week. It's $8 billion a month. This is just U.S., right. The U entire U.N. peacekeeping budget for all of Darfur, which I know a lot of you pay attention to. The entire UN peacekeeping operation budget for peacekeeping in southern Sudan, the area of Darfur, is 1.7 billion. That is less than a week of war waging costs. Just now, we're just talking dollar costs. We're not talking about Charlene and her kitchen costs. So to try and in any war, when you try to think what is, quote, the cost of a war, be sure you pay attention to the women whose emotional and physical labor, the government who's waging the war, any country who's waging the war, try to tally that into your accounting, which means you've got to be a different kind of accountant if any of you are doing uh, business administration. You have to be a different kind of accountant to actually tally up the cost of a war and to do it realistically and to see what governments depend on for waging wars, you have to pay attention to women 
especially civilian women. Now, at the same time, the other woman that I've been trying to, well, several, but I, I, there are a number of women that I just try, I, I try to stay realistic by paying attention to very particular women. And there's a woman named Nemo, N-E-M-O, and she doesn't use her last name. She's an entrepreneur in Baghdad. And she has a beauty parlor uh, in Baghdad, and a very smart Washington Post uh, reporter decided that paying attention to Nemo, and she uses Nemo in uh, Arabic, she uses Nemo's beauty parlor as the name of her um, little business uh, down this alleyway in Baghdad. Um, Nemo um, is somebody to keep track of to try and make sense not just of the costs of the war, but what does it mean to um, gain security? You know, a lot of us study national security and security studies. Well, what, is, what does security look like and what does insecurity look like? And one of the things that feminists around the world have been teaching me is that we're completely, for the most part, unrealistic when we talk about national security. That is, we don't really watch what security and insecurity looks like in the lives of most women. So Nemo is a good person to pay attention to if you want to be more realistic about security. And Nemo um, was able to run this beauty parlor uh, partly because she only has women clients. One of the things that happened um, after um, the first Gulf War is, you know, there were economic sanctions imposed on the government of Iraq. Saddam Hussein, government of Iraq. What this meant was, and there's a new book out by an Iraqi um, a PhD um, student who had now just finished, um, named uh, Yassin uh, Hussein, and this book will come out, I think this spring, maybe the fall. Um, and she has written a wonderful book about what was the impact of international economic sanctions, which you know are always talked about when a government seems to be doing something that the international community, always in quotes, um, finds despicable, then there's always discussion of, well, short of war, are economic sanctions the thing that can pull this government into line, can make it act responsibly or humanely? And so economic sanctions are often looked at as the best alternative to military action, external military action. Well, Yassim Hussein, in her study, she both looked at all the numbers, but she also went to various uh, classes of neighborhood in Baghdad. And here's what she found that, and this won't come as a surprise to Iraqi women, and that is that from the 1970s, early 70s on, that with the expansion of the Iraqi state, the expansion of services, the expansion of the government's um, offering of uh, various um, uh, services, that in fact more and more women were, got jobs, educated women, got jobs in the Iraqi civil service as engineers, as teachers, as doctors, as nurses, as accountants, as software engineers. And so the Iraqi government this is true in a lot of countries. The Iraqi government became one of the main employers of Iraqi women. OK, now you have economic sanctions post-1991, post-Gulf War I. Well, now think about what wasn't accounted for. And now think with your new feminist glasses on what you are going to account for, or at least you're going to ask. And what you're going to, one of the things you're going to ask is, has the, have the, econo the internationally imposed economic sanctions were very strongly backed by the United States. Have they had the same effect on women as they have had on men? And the answer is no. Because by 1991, a much higher percentage of, of women in employment were working for government agencies than were men who had employment. It was much more likely that men were able to find both government employment, but also private company employment. But women were really particularly um, likely uh, to find employment in government services. Those were the first things cut with the imposition of the, uh, economic, the international economic sanctions. And so unemployment skyrocketed amongst women, not just in March 
03, but in um, August of 1991. Nemo is interesting because a lot of women, and you'll hear this from um, Iraqi women themselves, a lot of women who were highly educated, they were engineers in the state electricity um, uh, corporation. A lot of women then tried to find jobs. I mean, if they had jobs, they still needed jobs. Tried to find jobs in the private sector. But as in every society, there are notions about what is proper for women to do and what is not proper for women to do. What does a respectable woman do and what does a respectable woman not do? And that's true in the United States, of course, too. And working in the private sector, was seen by many parents, but also by many women themselves and amongst the men that in their lives, as less respectable, as more questionable for their own status as respectable female people. So it wasn't so easy to actually go from a public sector job, which was now being eliminated because of the sanctions, to a private sector job. So Nemo becomes very interesting because, in fact, she was able to create a um, women-only clientele, which allowed her to slip through the cracks here and still have some kind of income-generating um, business, and yet not lose her respectability. Now, this, law, this um, journalist, women journalist from the Washington Post, decided that she'd go spend a day in Nemo's very small, you know, a third of the size of this room, beauty parlor. Now, this is really smart political um, journalism. She wanted to overhear the discussions amongst Nemo and her clients. And you know this from the coverage of the presidential primaries, that the American political parties have now discovered that, in fact, if you really want to influence uh, women's voting, go and find out what's happening in beauty parlors, right? Because that's where a lot of political discussions go on. You know, it's not only, you know, what do you want the streak to look like, it is also, well, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? Did you see that on television? Well, that's also true in Nemo's beauty parlor. And what this journalist found was that the discussion was about policing. That this is what Nemo and her clients talked about. They talked about how secure and insecure is it to go out of your house. But they also, these are very savvy women from modest means. They also discussed um, what happens when you go to the local police and complain that, in fact, there's the threat of, or actuality, of kidnapping. Or that um, there's the worry about being detained by these American soldiers who, of course, don't speak Arabic. And that the local police just responded this journalist heard them say to each other, responded by saying, that's not our job. That's not the priority at this time. In other words, your insecurities are not real insecurities. When we talk about insecurity, we mean political insecurity. Well, these women meant political insecurity too, but that's not what the local police were hearing. Now, who were these police trained by? The United States. The United States came in and as part of their nation building, the United States government, as part of their nation building project, they rebuilt the entire police force. The rebuilding of police forces in East Timor, in Liberia, in Afghanistan, in Sierra Leone, the rebuilding of police forces is now considered one of the major projects for rebuilding a political system. But if I was just in a discussion with women from Liberia who were who had become very senior police officers in the new Liberia under uh, Ellen uh, Sirleaf Johnson. And one of the things that you'll hear is that most of the corporations that are being contracted by the United States to train other countries' new police forces are doing no gender training. They are, they are building brand new police forces without discussions of domestic violence, without discussions of, of violence against women, without even gender training. DynCorp, D-Y-N-C-O-R-P, DynCorp, which is one of the major um, rebuilders, contractors, 
rebuilding police forces and militaries around the world, the Liberian women said, no gender training. But we don't have any control over DynCorp. You know, DynCorp's under um, a US contract. We, so in Nemo's beauty parlor, they were seeing the end result of this. And they were judging whether their lives post-US occupation were becoming more secure or not, not just by whether they felt secure or insecure on the streets of Baghdad, but whether the new government's police force took their definitions of security and insecurity seriously. So Nemo and Nemo's beauty parlor, if one is realistic, is one of the places to go listen for politics, which means when I think of what I was trained to look, where I was trained to go to understand politics when I was at Berkeley, nobody, nobody said, sit around for an afternoon in a beauty parlor. You'll get a really good sense of international politics. But in fact, this journalist from the Washington Post had a much more realistic notion of what is a political space. And a political space is any place that women or men try to assess not only their securities and their insecurities, but the causes of their securities and insecurities. And in Nemo's beauty parlor, you got a very sharp picture of what was causing increasing insecurity. And it wasn't just that there were rogue militias. It was that there was a new, newly built, newly half-built state apparatus that did not take women's lives seriously, did not listen to women, did not take women's security seriously as they measured, that is accounting, measured security. So if you take Nemo and you take Charlene Kane and you say, OK, now let's really, let's be more realistic about one, what does it take for a government to wage war? And that's mobilizing a lot of civilian women, especially as wives and mothers. And then how do you measure whether a war, in fact, has increased or decreased the level of felt security in a society, and you listen to Nemo, you have a much better, deeper, more complex understanding of what does it take to really create genuine security. Nemo and Charlene, not people I was ever taught to take seriously. But now I take them seriously, and as a result, I think one gets a much better sense of how to make sense of the Iraq War. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, I understand one of the great things about Dickinson is you have really good discussions and, you know. So um, we've got hands up already. This is, this is a great gra crowd. Great. Okay. Hi there. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, I had a question sort of comparing um, the Iraq War to the World War II. Yeah, um, sure. And saying that World War II, you always hear of these stories of the huge mobilization of women um, and sort of rewarded, I guess, publicly for it. Um, yes. Sort of look at the great things that women are doing for this country. Why isn't that sort of happening for the Iraq War, um, given what you sort of explained In about the US. why they're mobilized so much? Sort of why don't we hear uh, these great campaigns sort of, you know, and you know, yeah. complimenting these women for, for doing these things. That's really interesting. Well, there are a couple of things there. One, in there's a, a wonderful film that maybe some of you have seen in classes or you've seen otherwise and uh, should look at again. It's a, a film called The Life and Times of Rosie the Riveter. And it's made by California Newsreel. Um, you can get it online. And w w I, I show this film in class. And I really try to keep the lights down because I cry at the end. It's very embarrassing, right? <laughs> and the reason, and you, you know when you've seen something and you know you cry at it, you think, oh, not this time. You know, I, no, I've got, I've got my act together, you know. I'm not going to, but I do. And I'll tell you why. Because what, this is a documentary about the American women um, who were mobilized to take men's places in um, the industrial workforce, especially in shipbuilding, plane building, and uh, tank building. And um, both African American women and white women are being interviewed in the film. It's, very, it's a great film. And they take five women and follow their 
um, experiences. And here's the thing, that you're absolutely right that there was a mobilization of the entire economy. Um, World War II is oftentimes thought of in the American experience as um, a total war. That is, the, in, the government felt that it had to mobilize the entire economy, not just all the people, but the entire economy, in order to wage what was one of the most industrialized wars in human history. And as a result, there were many, many debates about how to use women. Because the, remember, this was a war to protect the American way of life. So you're protecting the American way of life, but in fact your policies are changing the American way of life. And governments get very confused about this. They want to do both. They want to claim that the war that you're sacrificing for is in fact to protect the national way of life, but in fact to protect the national way of life, in fact you have to undermine it. In this case, it's not only that women were being brought um, into better paying industrial jobs. A lot of African American women were already working for pay but you were bringing them into jobs that were considered strictly manly jobs. In fact, that's why they were so high paid, right? Rosie the Riveter was riveting, right? And riveting was considered a highly skilled, manly, unionized, all those things, industrial job. So when you brought women into it, did that mean actually women could have done it all along? Well, if women can do it all along, is it that skilled? I mean, that's what, you know, if you're patriarchal, that's the way you kind of go. And there was a lot of resistance by um, labor unions, male-led labor unions, about bringing women into these jobs because it was thought that it will kind of, you know, the emperor has no clothes. It will show that, in fact, they aren't just jobs that men can do. Actually, women are pretty good at riveting. Um, so there was debate. That's the first thing. So we've kind of heard the glossiest version of the story, which is women were brought in and they were celebrated and their wonderful footage from newsreels showing them being celebrated for wearing pants and turning up at these industrial jobs. But a lot of women, especially African American women, had to fight for every single right on the job. So at first, African American women were working in um, shipbuilding yards, um, but they were forced to use different bathrooms than white women. Um, there was segregation, I and mean, di segregation didn't disappear in World War II. But here's the part that makes me cry. A lot of these women actually found this work very satisfying. One, they got the best wages they'd ever gotten in their lives. Right? They weren't being cafeteria workers. They weren't being unpaid homemakers. They were actually getting paid good wages. But it was, quote, and this is the phrase in English, only for the duration. So what? This is, this is, governments really are on a high wire act here. The idea is, yes, women can, in, can really get satisfaction, skills, good wages out of this job. Even the government sponsored child care. For the duration of the war, it wasn't socialist to have <laughs> U.S. child care. At the end of the war, it was considered socialist. But so long as it was in the name of white fighting the war. So what happened at the end is that the US government apparatus did a complete U-turn. And they started doing it in 1944. That is, with the defeat of Germany before even the end of the war in the Pacific. And you, the, you see this in this film. They put out a whole new set of propaganda which said women need to be home with their children. And they would put out newsreels that would show children chasing a ball out into the street in front of a car. In 1942, they showed women, girl, children happy in daycare. But in 1944, it was very scary to think of women neglecting their children. And because what they were worried about is male veterans coming home and not coming back to the good paying jobs that they'd left that that was considered such a political risk that you could not tolerate it. So most of those women lost their jobs. And when you see the film, you guess which part brings, makes me teary. Um, so yes, the, the two things about the US war in Iraq. The first is it's not being fought as a total war. Right? Um, it has not, not mobilized the American economy um, for war waging the way World War II did. 
And as a result, there isn't as much push to bring women in to fill jobs in the industrial sector that men are being recruited away from. The second thing is that the story of Rosie the Riveter isn't the story of Rosie the Riveter we've all learned. The story of Rosie the Riveter, just like any war, never stop your attention on a war when the Treaty of Surrender is signed. Always, this is one of the things I learned as a, uh, actually not just as a feminist, but when I was uh, for many years uh, thinking about how racism and ethnicity work in militaries before I was a feminist, unfortunately. Um, and one of the things I learned when I watched what happens to African Americans in the American military or what happens to Fijian um, men in the British military, one of the th things I learned is always keep your eyes wide open for at least five years after the historians say the war ended. Because in this time called post-war, that's still defined by the war. Always watch post-war. Always watch who loses and who wins in the post-war. Always watch which ideological campaign gets turned on its head when, in fact, they aren't needed to fight the war. So two things about World War II. One, and this war, this is not a industrially total war mobilization. And second of all, the myth of Rosie the Riveter is the myth of Rosie the Riveter if you follow it to 1948 and you don't end in 1945. But it's a, it's a great kind of comparison to make. If you look at other countries, if you look at Vietnam, in fact, you find some of the same things. We shouldn't just be Americocentric here. That, well, no, let's take Iraq, because let's think about the Iran-Iraq war. A lot of the Saddam Hussein mobilization of women in the 1980s um, to fight the very long, devastating war with Iran. That was an eight-year war. Um, in fact, it encouraged the Iraqi government to bring more and more women into the civil service precisely so that more and more Iraqi men could be mobilized uh, for the Iraqi military to fight the war with Iran. And I remember talking to a Saudi woman who was working for the UN right in the middle of the Iraq-Iran war. And she had just come back from Baghdad. And she, she was really serious. She said, we had a cup of coffee in Boston, and she said, don't you think actually as awful as wars are, they are good for women? And I said, well, tell me what you mean. She said, well, I'm just back from Baghdad. The Iran-Iraq war is a, has been a devastating war, but it's really been good for Iraq women. That is, it really has in, in forced the government to bring more and more women into highly skilled civil service jobs because they have to, the government has to uh, recruit men to fight the war um, with Iran. But again, it was, it's only short term, because after wars are over, governments go back to what they think is normal. And what they think is normal is women in some places and men in other places, and men are usually in the places that have the better pay and the more prestige. And this also happened in Iraq. It was then exacerbated by the U.S.-backed uh, U.N. Uh, economic sanctions from 1991 onwards. Um, long answer to a really great question. <laughs> Other things or stories or things that makes you think of. Yes, hi, Bill. I have a question. Maybe just some insight. I was very fascinated by your initial comments about the effort. I can usually can be heard. <laughs> about the effort to uh, influence guidance counselors, high school guidance counselors, and teachers, and. Your comments reminded me of a situation I experienced at the Harrisburg Airport, actually, mm. last fall, but I, I haven't fully reflected upon or followed up on. And that was I was sitting waiting for a flight to Chicago, and I noticed gathering around me some, some, very, um, some folks that were speaking about various military installations. Uh, they clearly did not appear to be active military. They, they were not what mm -hmm. I would call military ready. Uh, and I eventually was curious enough to approach one of them. And I said, what, what are you doing? I mean, are you with the military? And they said, no, we're teachers, but we have been invited to attend a military orientation oh, at a military base. Now, do you have any insight into, this was clearly all paid for yes, by the military. Absolutely. Is this in the, the, the tradition of what you're talking about? Because what is interesting is we in higher education obviously have to be very careful about when we accept money, when it might influence our choices about where our students go. Absolutely. But here, clearly, it's being conducted without that caution. 
Uh, any is that is well, I think part of it? The, I think the Defense Department is, uh, as I say, they're very sophisticated. And I don't mean to talk conspiratorially now. They try to think, they're worried that the American public doesn't understand, right? And so they, they do it with business executives. They do it with engineers. They do it with teachers. They do it with guidance counselors. They, the Defense Department thinks a lot about um, bringing people in. I mean, just if you, the kind of the most visible version of it is when they have kind of um, family day, you know, at an aircraft carrier, right? Um, that is this notion that if we only got to know the military better, we would be just more positively inclined, not just towards the military, but towards everything the military is asked to do by the civilian superiors. And the the bringing of teachers, that's so interesting. The, really, very interesting. Very interesting, many of whom are probably mothers as well, but weren't brought because they're mothers, but because they're teachers. Um, so it, it's, and it's one of the things that if you, again, another pun, there's so many military puns that we use, but it's under the radar. That is that, that I know, isn't that awful? In the trenches, under the radar, you know, targeting. I mean, really, American English is just riddled another pun, um, with, with these military analogies. By the way, the military uses sports analogies, right? So they talk football, we talk military. And as a result, we all are perfectly understandable to each other. But, um, but, it, but it, it is true that the US military, not unique in the world, um, but certainly distinctively in the world, um, uses every kind of public affairs, social science um, set of skills that are available. Um, and now that they are dependent on a all-volunteer force, they pull out even more rabbits out of the hat. Um, when they had the draft, they were concerned about public um, um, attitudes towards the military and military service. But since 1973, when, they, when the US Congress, because they were so worried about the disaffection of the white middle class, all right, you have to watch why the draft ended. It didn't end sort of without any concern about either race or class. They very, the, the, the overwhelmingly white male members of Congress in 1973 were really scared in 1973 about how alienated the white middle class parents had become with the war in Vietnam that was um, drafting their sons. Um, and since then, they've really gone into much higher gear around advertising, around these kinds of outreach programs. So that's a very interesting vignette of, of something a lot larger. Um, yeah, other thoughts, other stories, other things? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was just wondering, you gave us some wonderful insights into the micro level effects of war, which are very important to understand. But I was wondering, bringing it back to the macro level, if you could also comment a little bit on how you would think the face of international politics might be different with uh, women holding more positions of power in political arena and ne negotiations. All right. This is a good question to have a discussion of in Pennsylvania on the verge of April, isn't it? Um, well, the, there, I mean, there's, a lot of, of thinking about this. One is, and when I've done talks around and radio things and so on, I remember in Australia, I got so that I knew exactly what the overwhelmingly male talk show hosts were going to ask because they heard I was talking, this was now back in the early 90s, but they, it was the Gulf War. Um, they, so they, they immediately imagined that to be a feminist meant that you think that women are automatically peacemakers, right? So they, they put into my mouth that that was my argument. What they, they didn't say it. What they did was they came back and really by, I'm not kidding, I began to keep track by about the 13th radio interview um, in Australia. Um, I knew this question was going to be, what about, okay, what's the triad? What about Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, and Indira Gandhi? honestly, all said with an Australian accent, that 
that because it was presumed, as they say in British tabloids, gotcha, right? That is, you'll be stumped by that one, right? <laughs> That'll completely dismantle your whole, you know, commitment to feminist analysis, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, we all do that, you know, a little bit with people we think of, you know. Anyway, so, but, but it really raises a really, a, a very important point that you are making, and that is that, that it isn't women per se in power individually that really is the key. Because in each of those cases, in fact, it was fun then to answer the question, because it was very interesting. Every single one of those three women, all of whom were quite militaristic, in their attitudes towards their own country's militaries and towards their country's foreign policy. Every single one of them had come up through a highly patriarchal party political system. And all three of them were nominated for party leadership, which is how you get in all three systems, that's how you get to be prime minister. You have to be party leader first. It's very different than a presidential system. You have to be party leader first, and once you become party leader and your party wins a majority in the legislature, then you as party leader become prime minister, right? So Thatcher, Mayer, and um, uh, Gandhi all had been promoted by male elites in their political party. In some cases, because they thought they were controllable, right? That was definitely the thought about, uh, in the Congress party in India, the, the male bosses behind the scenes, they definitely thought that young Indira would be, you know, clay in their hands. Fools they. Um, but that's what they, but so she, so in all, in, in all three of those cases, none of them had a base in a women's movement. None of them thought of themselves as speaking um, for a broad-based women's movement. None of them made women's issues in their society priority issues. Um, and that really is part of what could make a difference. So that if you get a woman who gets into office and not only has a women's movement support, but actually is conscious of that support, like Gro Brundtland in Norway, she was very conscious that she had, that she really owed her climb in the Social Democratic Party of Norway and thus to the prime ministership of Norway. She knew because it was women in the party and women more broadly based concerned about social issues in Norway. She was quite conscious of that. And it's one of the reasons that in fact she prioritized non-militarized kinds of foreign policy. In fact, I remember once hearing a um, a press interview, I mean, hearing about it, uh, a press interview with Roe Brutland right after she'd become prime minister. And she, unlike every other government in the world, decided that her cabinet, which is about 36 members, her cabinet would be 50-50 men and women, right? Um, which is also true of Michelle Bachelet now in Chile, who also is aware she was backed by a women's movement. It makes a difference, right? That and um, so uh, Brundtland was asked by this big press corps, mainly men, uh, press corps, and it was, again, it was somebody trying to get a gotcha moment. And there was a, uh, a reporter, I think, from the BBC in the back of the room who said, Prime Minister Brundtland, um, I see that you have appointed, you know, 18 women and 18 men in your new cabinet. That's really quite historic. Um, but I also noticed, now this is the, you know, and you could just see licking his chops as he was saying it. Um, I also noticed that you didn't appoint a woman th to the Minister of Defense position. And you know, he, he was kind of savoring the moment. And now here's the awful thing. I also thought, well, that's interesting. Gosh, she didn't? But of course, I was so militarized, I thought in Norway, the Ministry of Defense may be an important position, right? <laughs> And what, what Gro Brundtland said, because he, he was, I think, from the BBC, he said, well, sir, actually in Norway, the Minister of Health is much more important than the Minister of Defense, <laughs> right? Now, the thing is, it's a double story, because I also thought, oh, not so much the gotcha part, but I also thought, oh, she didn't? Here was an opportunity, and she didn't? 
and it just showed how American I was. That is that I assumed that in any government's cabinet, the Minister of Defense must be one of the top three. It's usually Minister of Defense, in many countries Minister of um, Interior, because they control the National Police Force, um, and um, Minister of Finance. That's in most governments around the world, those are the, those are the, the big three, aside from the Prime Minister. But not in Norway. Well, sir, actually the Minister of Health is more important than the Minister of Defense in Norway. Um, so a couple of things. One, unless you have a women's movement that has really made militarism problematic as they think about how to improve the whole society, unless you get people rising up in the political party system that actually are conscious of their indebtedness to and have been educated by being in contact with that women's movement, it won't make a difference. If they are women who are just stovepiped up through a still patriarchal party system, which happens still in a lot of countries, Sri Lanka is a good example, um, and, and Pakistan, um, in fact, it won't have that impact. So it, it means that for any of us who are trying to think, does Bachelet make a difference? Yeah, I have Chilean feminist friends who are very excited about Bachelet. But it's because she really has been informed by, I don't mean she's perfect or anything, but she's been informed by, um, educated by, and feels indebted to um, the women's movement that's been mobilized and has been in the forefront of anti-militarism in transforming Chilean society after Pinochet. Yeah, hi. Do you think it's possible, um, and how, for, for women to hold on to the, to the gains and progressions that they make in, a, in, a, in the post-war period in a country like Iraq? Right. Well, I'm not sure if they've made any gains. The, uh, the, the thing, I think, is, is that can they regain what they had in the 1970s and maybe into the mid-1980s? I mean, for, for, Ira for Iraqi women, um, that is really a lot of the, the struggle by Iraqi um, activist women. There's a wonderful, there are two or three new books that have come out now by Iraqi um, uh, feminist-informed women uh, scholars. One is by, if you're looking for something to read, by Nadja, N-A-D-J-E, Al-Ali, A-L hyphen A-L-I, Nadja Al-Ali, who is currently at um, the uh, University of London in London, but she has just written a book, it's in paperback, and it's called Iraqi Women, and then it has a subtitle with something about voices or something. But the thing is, for the first time, honestly, I felt so ignorant. I mean, I read the book and it was just an eye-opener to me. Nadja Al-Ali went back and did a, a study of Iraqi women's political activism from the 1950s on. Well, that was news to me. I mean, it's just terrible to think it was news to me, but it was news to me. I hadn't realized that Iraqi women had been so sophisticatedly organized and debated each other. I don't mean they all agreed. They were in competing political parties. A lot of them were associated with the, the Communist Party because it was the most progressive party in the 1960s, and 50s, 60s, and 70s. Some were in the non-Communist Party movement but were in women's. I had no idea that all this thinking about the Constitution all this thinking about the penal code, all this thinking about women in the workforce, all this thinking about what women's relationship should be to higher education. I had not a clue that this had been so intensely and detailed thought about by activist women. Those Iraqi women, they virtually still all exist. A lot of them that were active in the 70s are now still only in their 40s and 50s. They were in university when they became politically at active. A lot of them have had to go into um, exile. There are now two million Iraqis in Syria. There are over another million Iraqis in Jordan. And then they are scattered all around the world. And many of them are the most highly educated women uh, because women and men um, in professional jobs are oftentimes the ones who are targeted by the most conservative of the armed militias. So they, the brain drain has been severe in Iraq. So I think actually the way to think about the future of Iraqi women, and I am certainly not going to speak for Iraqi women, but just listening to what at least the Iraqi women that I've listened to is 
not, not to go backwards, but to at least imagine to recapture some of the gains made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then go on from there with Iraqi women themselves doing the organizing. You know, the idea that Americans thought that we would go in and tutor Iraqi women on democracy. I mean, give me a break. And, and Iraqi women are, were so insulted because they said, what is Lynn Cheney at all? Because her groups got a lot of the contract money from the Defense Department to send in groups of women to train Iraqi women in democracy. And I thought, who should be training who? <laughs> right? I don't mean that. I don't mean that all Iraqi women, you know, know everything about election campaigning, but we don't either, and we certainly don't know everything about the judicial system or about policing. Um, or about political parties um, being made um, less patriarchal. We don't know about them either. But I think for a lot of Iraqi women that I listen to anyway, it has just sound, we have, Americans have sound so ignorant. It'd be like people coming to the United States to lecture us about race who had never heard of the Civil War, right? That is. If we are going to, if, the, if things are going to be done in our name, I get kind of worked up about this. <laughs> Did you notice that? But really, if we're, if we're going to, if we are going to have any kind of helpful alliances, I mean real alliances in the world, it's got to be based on some kind of curiosity. I mean, we actually, and if we're not, if we don't want to spend the energy being curious about Ireland, or being curious about Iraq, or being curious about the Congo, or being curious about Japan. If we don't want, and that's okay, then don't pretend that we're going to go and teach somebody something. So I think from what I can understand, and certainly you know more than I do, but from what I understand, there is a lot of dismay, just outright aghastness, is that a word? Um, at the kind of naivete and downright insulting ignorance that we didn't know anything about women's organizing and women's political party activism and the amount of writing, some in the form of poetry, other in the form of legal documents, that had been going on for two full generations amongst Iraqi women. So when this new constitution has been hammered out, the is it Article 41? What's the article that's, is it Article 41 that's got the possibility of, yes, right. It's, there, there's an article that is sitting right smack in the new Iraqi constitution overseen by the United States occupation authorities that has a loophole as big as a barn door to allow for the complete rollback of the victories won by Iraqi women to have control over divorce, inheritance, and marriage. And that's sitting right there, right in this, quote, new, progressive, reformist constitution. And a lot of the organizing being done by Iraqi women in Iraq and um, overseas is to repeal that um, article. But that's the new constitution. That's the constitution that, in fact, has replaced a much um, more progressive constitution that Iraqi organized women fought for and won in the 1970s. Um, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm just humbled when I read things by Naja al-Ali and others and realize, I mean, I don't know anything. You know, I'm in kindergarten here. And if you're in kindergarten, you don't go tell somebody how to do a heart operation. So I, we just have a, we have a, we have a lot to learn, and, and one of the first steps is humility, right? And humility can be really hard to learn, you know? It's embarrassing, right? Um, but at least it's a good place to start. Thanks a lot, everybody.